Hi, my name is Kelsey O'Neill, and today I'll be talking about the walking corpse syndrome, or Cotard's delusion. This delusion was so named by Jules Cotard, who treated Mademoiselle X in, 19th, in the 19th century, who claimed that she had no brain, no nerves, no chest, no stomach, and no intestines. She also believed that she was immortal and thus didn't see the need to eat and died of starvation. So obviously that's the reason why it's called the walking corpse syndrome is because these people believe that they are dead. But this was not the first documentation of Cotard syndrome. It was first documented by Charles Bonnet in 1788 that an elderly woman believed she was dead and was upset that her family hadn't buried her yet. They finally relented by putting her in a shroud and mourning her. Um, she was treated with a powder of precious stones and opium, and her delusions went away, but they returned every few months. The definition of this syndrome is, a, is that it's a rare delusional disorder linked to depression, suicidal ideation, sleep deprivation, or derealization, derealization, in which a person believes that he or she is dead or dying, doesn't exist, is putrefying, or has lost his or her blood or internal organs. Now, I would like to add to this list that they believe that they are immortal, because that is another common symptom. Um, the cause of this syndrome is unknown. Some say that it has to do with the temporal and frontal lobes in the right hemisphere, which causes the delusions, or it could be in the left hemisphere, which causes the hallucinations, or that it's typically due to a lack of blood flow in these certain areas, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, some say that it has to do with the fusiform gyrus misfiring, um, and that's what Ramachandran talked about in his book. Um, and it has to do with, uh, because the fusiform gyrus has to do with um, facial recognition, and so when you see people, you don't really get that warm glow because it has to do with the amygdala, and so you get that warm glow when you see people or when you see yourself, and so you think, oh, there's a disconnect there, so I must be dead. Um, there are, on the other hand, typical pre-existing symptoms for these people. Um, they usually have a loss of sleep, loss of appetite, anxiety, or depression. And this syndrome is typically, um, it typically occurs in older adults with depressive disorders. For instance, there was a 78-year-old who had pre-existing symptoms of depressed mood anhedonia, which means that you don't take joy in anything, um, not sex, not laughing, not other people, nothing. Um, he also struggled with anorexia, loss of interest in self-care and hygiene, ideas of self-loathing, and delusional ideas of ruin and catastrophe, and he was later diagnosed with Parkinsonism. And he claimed that he was already dead and there was no point in treating him because he felt like an automaton and like he was completely eliminated. He was ultimately treated with mirtazapine and um, electroconvulsive therapy and was completely cured after only one month. And um, so I'm going to list off a lot of drugs in all of these cases that I talk about, like mirtazapine, um, and I'm going to talk about uh, electroconvulsive therapy just a little bit, but I'm going to leave most of that to my presentation partner, Jason Patterson, and he's going to talk a lot more about the drugs that are um, able to treat in some ways this syndrome and also electroconvulsive therapy and what that does and what it means. This disorder is also associated with mental disorders such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and dementia. Um, for instance, there was a 27-year-old who had pre-existing symptoms of schizophrenia and a SPECT, which I'll talk about later, showed left parietal, left temporal, and left inferior frontal hypoperfusion. And hypoperfusion simply means a lack of blood flow. Um, and all hypoperfusion was treated using electroconvulsive therapy, olanzapine, and quetiapine. This syndrome is also associated with brain trauma, brain atrophy, and um, uh, brain tumors, seizure disorders, brain injury, migraines, Parkinson's disease, and stroke. Um, for instance, there was a case in 1970 where a woman with Parkinson's had the delusion that her husband was dead. And when it was pointed out to her that she was speaking to her husband, she developed the, del the delusion that she was dead. Um, it also could be a consequence of, ad of an adverse reaction to a ciclovir, an antiviral drug, in patients with renal failure, 
and it's because they might be able to be unable to excrete a metabolite of acyclovir called CMMG, which accumulates in the blood and could cause the symptoms. What's unique about this syndrome is that it has three definitive stages. And so to show that, I'm going to talk about patient Y and how she goes through all of these stages. So the first stage is the germination stage, where the characteristic features of depressive mood, hypochondria, um, and worry and fear of one's illness all arise despite medical treatment. And so in March to May, she showed hypochondriasis, depression, and suicidal ideation. The second stage is blooming where true features of the syndrome, the delusion of being dead or immortal, um, and anxiety and negativism arise. And for patient Y, she couldn't taste food, she couldn't smell coffee, she couldn't see rain, or she couldn't hear clocks. And her organs didn't work, and her brain was broken. And she said, why should I commit suicide? Now I have a body that does not die. The third stage, and the final stage, is the chronic stage, where um, severe depression due to emotional disturbances or paranoia arise. Um, and for patient Y, she had poor facial expression, hypochondriacal, and negation delusions, um, and all these things remained at first, but after the ninth therapy session, all symptoms had disappeared. Now, the diagnosis for this um, syndrome is usually, um, you can get that by looking at the patient's history and the, their symptoms. Um, there are also many tests that you can run. For instance, you could run a blood test, or you could do a CT scan, which is a computerized tomographic scan. And um, there is an example of this with a 46-year-old male who had pre-existing symptoms of Marfan syndrome, double vision, sudden loss of memory, um, he showed left parietal, oh, and sudden loss of memory. Um, after, when they did the scan, he showed left posterior parietal hemorrhagic infarct in the CT scan. They also did an MR scan, which showed a cryptic vascular malformation in the medial part of the right cerebral hemisphere and in several other sites. He felt like his flesh was rotting off his bones and smelled putrefaction. Symptoms disappeared days later. So obviously that's a very interesting case because he had lots of pre-existing symptoms and then the symptoms just randomly disappeared. Um, you could also run a SPECT, which is a single photon emission computed tomography. And um, for example, there was a case of Mr. A who had pre-existing symptoms of severe depression and he performed a SPECT one week before and then during and then one month after the 12 ECT treatments, or electro electroconvulsive treatments. Um, before, he showed reduced blood flow in the frontoparietal medial and dorsolateral frontal cortex, basal ganglia, and thalamus, which increased after the treatments. And the journal said that the frontal, dorsolateral, and basal ganglia perfusion deficits, or lack of blood flow, may be involved in the production of the patient's major depression, and the medial, frontoparietal, and thalamic perfusion def deficits may be related to the production of a degraded body schema. Now, um, a body schema is basically where your body gets all of these sensory inputs from the outside world. And um, what it does is it kind of forms a mental picture of where your body is in space. And so, you know, through all these inputs, you know, how you feel where you are, you know, and how you feel like your feet are and how your posture is and all that kind of stuff, that's... Um, that's basically creating a body schema in your mind. And so if you have a, a degraded body schema, then you would feel like you didn't know where you are in relation to other people, in relation to the rest of the world. And so that may cause the symptoms of Cotard syndrome. Um, you could also run an EEG. And, um, oh, some treatments. So typically the treatments are drugs and electroconvulsive therapy. So for drugs, you could do antidepressants, antipsychotics, and mood stabilizer in medications. Um, a, an example of this is the 57-year-old man who had pre-existing symptoms of depression. He lived nine years of his life believing he, he was dead. And um, this gentleman, Mr. Graham, his mind was, he believed that his mind was blank and that he had lost a sense of taste and smell, and he suffered from anhedonia, which is where you can't take pleasure in anything. He spent a lot of time in cemeteries because he felt that they were the only places where he could fit in. 
and his doctor said that Graham's recovery began after scans found that levels of activity in parts of his brain were so low they almost matched the brain of somebody in a vegetative state. His doctor said that he had never seen anyone who was on his feet, who was interacting with people, with such an abnormal scan result. And um, Graham was treated with psychotherapy and drug treatment. He could also use electroconvulsive therapy, and that can be very, very helpful and tends to be actually very, very helpful in carrying these people. Finally, I want to talk about the association between lycanthropy and Cotter's delusion or Cotter's syndrome because there seems to be some sort of a correlation there. Now, lycanthropy is the disease where you believe that you have been turned into an animal or that your family members have been turned into animals. Um, an example of this is a 32-year-old male in Iran who had pre-existing symptoms of restless, tearful, oh, he was restless, tearful, refusing to work, and um, he believed that his death was due to his sins during his life as a human being and that God protected him so that no poison could harm him. He also believed that he and his wife were turned into dogs and that his three daughters were turned into sheep. He also had olfactory hallucinations, anxiety, and guilt feelings with delusional intensity. Lycanthropic delusions occurred after the Cotter syndrome set in. Um, and he was treated with valparate, risperidone, and electroconvulsive therapy, and the main signs relieved after two weeks. A second example is of a 37-year-old female in India who had pre-existing symptoms of um, decreased sleep, anxiety, restlessness, and worries about the future, but she had no personal or family history of any mental disorder. And um, she, went, she underwent surgery because she believed that she had breast cancer, and so that's part of the hypochondriasis. But unfortunately, she uh, developed a wound infection and her hypochondria worsened. She believed that her body parts were decomposing and being replaced by body parts of a pig. She also expressed that she deserved the punishment by God in this way because she did not perform certain religious rituals and did not take a promised pilgrimage. And this was treated with venlafaxine, olanzapine, and electroconvulsive therapy over the course of a couple of weeks. Now, the correlation between lycanthropy and Cotard syndrome is very interesting because it adds another factor. I mean, it's not just that these people believe that they're dead. It's not even just that they believe that they've been turned into animals. It's the religious aspect that seems to be interesting and that I really couldn't find any conclusive research on. But I thought that that was very interesting. And I was wondering if it might have to do with um, the religious aspect of these cultures. They're from Iran and India. And so maybe it has to do with their religions that may believe in reincarnation into certain animals. I don't know what's going on there, but I thought that that was very interesting and I would love any ideas that have anything to do with that. Um, so thus, there is very little to no evidence about this syndrome as there are so many factors and so few of the cases have anything in common. And the lack of information about the causes may also be due to the physicians not requiring the proper tests to be run and merely stating that an antipsychotic and antidepressant drug and the electroconvulsive therapy worked and then leaving it at that. And so, unfortunately, there really isn't that much information as to what actually causes this disease, but um, there is so much more that can be discovered about this bizarre syndrome since it was first documented in the 18th century. Well, thank you for listening, and I hope you have a wonderful day.